I would suggest that the real crazies today are out there. Actually, may I have some lights in the room? I'd like to ask a question to the audience. How many of you are sympathizing with the crazies? Well, actually, I don't almost see anybody who doesn't. More intriguing is what those people are after. Because I claim they haven't figured it out yet how to express it. And what I hope to convey to you in the next 20 minutes is what I suspect it is. The first point that I'd like you to take home is what they don't say but imply. Political democracy without monetary democracy just doesn't work. And the second point is we have moved out of the industrial age and we keep on using industrial age monetary concepts. The idea of a single currency. How many of you have used in America or in their own country a currency other than the national currency? Okay, very few. Well, let me ask you another question. How many of you have used me the frequent flyer miles? So, the majority of you are using complementary currencies without knowing it. Now, the ones that you're familiar with don't have a particularly useful purpose. They just try to contract you back to the same airline or the same shop. That doesn't change anything for society. But I claim that these technologies are available to do very, very, very important things, i.e. meet the challenges of the 21st century. Now, I will need light again. I have like to make a survey here. How many of you have taken a, a course of economics, at least one? Oh, well, almost everybody. So you will know the answers to all these questions. <laughs> Who creates money? Is it the government? Anybody believe that? All right, you're better informed than a few years ago. 90% of Americans believed that it was the government until three years ago. Is it the central bank? Anybody believe that? Mm, a few, okay. Is it someone else? <laughs> All right. There seem to be lots of people who have not raised their hands. <laughs> so I suspect that you haven't quite figured it out yet. So how is money created? That's the next question. You know that in all the newspapers, in all the TV programs. They always show the printing presses, right? When they talk about money, bzz, there it is. Is that where money is created? Anybody believe that? All right, they're getting very scared here. <laughs> All right. Is it, anybody believe that it's with debts, with banks? Very few, okay, but some. The last ones have it. Every dollar you have seen is someone's debt. The government debt, corporate debt, or private debt, which is issued with interest by the banking system. Recently, there have been some exceptions. That's why the people were saying, when the Fed stepped in because nobody was doing things, they were doing that same thing. But normally, it's done by the private sector, by the banking system. Now, still another question. Why is it that nobody Everybody uses dollars in America. Why does it everybody in Japan use yen? Everybody in England, pounds. How is the monopoly enforced? Is there somewhere a machine gun that's ready to shoot you if you try to do something different? Is there a law that says it's illegal to do that? How many believe that? Big silence. The answer is taxes. Businesses can exchange things, whatever they want. There are actually 550 barter companies in America, commercial barter. However, you need to pay your taxes, and there's only one thing that's acceptable. It's this bank debt money called dollars. 
the purpose, the systemic purpose of taxes is to give value to the currency that is being requested. So does that sink in, what that means? What has changed here? And isn't it interesting that all of you two courses of economics and nobody told you? Hmm? Now, what is money? Let's start with that. That you have seen in your courses, every one of you, right? That's the textbook answer, okay? The three functions of money, units of account, medium of exchange, store of value, fine. That's not what money is. That's what money does. You understand the difference? When you have covered the functions, you don't even think about anything else. Of course, it's the only thing you use. In fact, my definition is different. It's an agreement. It's an agreement that it lives in the same in our heads. It's in the same space as marriage, political parties, business contracts. All right? It's an agreement within a community. The community can be the nation state traditionally, with one exception since 1945, the US dollar, because of the treaty, which is another agreement of Bretton Woods to use something standardized as a medium of exchange. So the three key words are agreement, community, and medium of exchange. Now, when someone invented marriage, the next morning, someone invented divorce, <laughs> right? So, with the way we look at money, there is no divorce. You have to live with it, you're born in it. The agreement is unconscious. It's like fish in water. Fish were born in water, live their entire lives in water, die in water, and have no clue what water is. That's how we live with money. And we assume that money is neutral. That it's just a passive medium of exchange that does things. It isn't. And anybody who's been dealt with money, whether you're a man or a woman, knows that you need to be pretty aggressive to make it work. It's programmed for a certain set of values, which are industrial age values. Anyway, that's my plan. Now that we've cleared a bit of decks, you can turn up the lights. I'm not going to ask you questions anymore. You all passed the test that there's something to learn. <laughs> now. I'm going to make a further claim that because we have a monoculture in money, because we are using only one type of money, that is the very reason why it is unstable. And then I'll show you some examples of creating the diversity that's needed. So this, every crisis is always perceived as the first one. Here are the statistics, 145 banking crashes. 204 monetary crashes, 72 from debt crisis in the last 40 years. And by the way, the problem is older than that. Kindleberger made an inventory of 48 complete meltdowns between the tulips in 1637 and 1929. So we're dealing with a systemic problem. And the systemic problem is, is assumed to be just something that happens, quote unquote, in development. We have proof, scientific proof, peer reviewed proof, in five different articles, in which I was involved, that monetary monoculture causes the structural instability that you're seeing here. That's what a monoculture looks like. Let's give credit to one thing about it. It is efficient. It produces a lot of stuff. That's the good part. But a match in there, well, everything is gone. That's what high diversity does. It's a little less efficient, but it actually provides much higher resilience. That's what we need. We need monetary diversity. I'm somewhere in Oban's land here. Every textbook of economics has assumed the monopoly of currency everywhere. So 
Let's go to the monetary innovations. And among the many examples, I've been following about 5,000 monetary innovations in the world. And there are about 50 different types. So I had to choose, given the time constraints that we're living here. And I'm going to give two that actually match, I believe, what the Occupy Wall Street people are talking about. We need jobs. Okay? This can be created through businesses themselves. And I'll show you how. And I think it's time to realize our dreams. And this whole conference is actually manifesting lots of those. These are routine life projects. But you need to get out of the money box. <laughs> Within the box, you won't find solutions. One, the first one is an old one. Actually, we should realize when you talk about jobs, you talk about small and medium-sized businesses. Around the world, and in most parts of the world, there are very few exceptions. Brooke, Detroit was one, <laughs> where the 90% of all private jobs are actually created by small businesses. So the future of jobs is the future of small businesses. Now, a colleague of mine from Rensselaer University made a study on Switzerland. Switzerland is well known to be a very stable economy, more stable than all its neighbors. You know, there are Italians in Switzerland, and somehow it works differently. Okay? <laughs> and they're French. I mean, and God forbid, it works differently. They just live across the border, and something happens that are different. I do claim it's not the cows, it's not the mountains, okay? and it's not the chocolates, because Belgium would be more stable than Switzerland. <laughs> So, we have a system that's operational for 75 years, started in 1934 by 17 business people, and they started creating money themselves. I sell you something, I have a credit in Weir, which is the name of the currency, one Weir because one Swiss franc, and I have a debit, you, you have a debit, sorry. This is. So, in other words, if you were doing something back for me, at that point, it would simply be barter, okay? However, if in my credit, I can buy something from you, and you can sell him something, or her something, we've created a currency between all of us. And that currency is just without interest, without having to go to the bank. That's the key. It is always insufficiency. So that little system that nobody talks about has been macroeconomically proven in several peer-reviewed papers that it is the secret for the stability of Switzerland. Why don't we do the same everywhere else? In fact, for those interested, here you have the reference for the website. It's in four languages. There is an improvement on the weir that has been developed over the last 10 years. Um, and it is now operational in Brazil and in Uruguay. It's a convertible weir. In other words, a weir that can be changed into national currency under certain specific conditions. Now, by having that done, it makes it possible for the government to accept this currency in payment of taxes, something which the Swiss never could do. All right? So here we have one country, Uruguay, that is today accepting two types of currencies. One, the conventional bank debt money, and another one, business-to-business -business currency, that is at equal value for making exchanges and accepts all payment of taxes and fees. Bingo, everybody accepts it. That is what I talk about as an example of monetary diversity. Good. Last year, I was given in Belgium, in the city of Ghent, an impossible task. They gave me the worst neighborhood, not only of Ghent, but all, all of Flanders. There are extraordinary densities of population, 23,000 per square mile. Uh, more than about half of the population is first generation. A good deal are illegal. And there are 20 languages, including the main one actually is Turkish. So we're talking of what they call a problem or a difficult neighborhood. And the question is, can we create that as a nice neighborhood to live in where people say hello to each other 
and which is greening, which is one of the, the, the priorities of the city. The starting point was to ask what they went, and the answer was a little garden. So here's what it looks like. Now, these little gardens are available only for rent, but for rent in a special currency called the Torque. And these Torques can be used to buy, among other things, low energy lamps and stuff like that, which is the city wants to promote and is to rent for these little gardens. The consequence has been, how do you earn the Torques, sorry? Well, one of the things you need to do is clean up your neighborhood and keep it clean. And the second thing you need to do is plant stuff in other parts. And they do that. And the consequence has been the city has had more volunteers than they knew what to do with. Okay? Now, for the same euro budget, they have at the smaller scale, which is the pilot now, three times more results. And at the scale where it can be expanded that we're planning on it, 20 times more results. Second solution, realizing dreams, mutual learning. Now, what you're hearing today in a conference, you'll remember 5%, okay, on the average. If you read an article or a book that I wrote, you remember 10%. If we have a little session this afternoon about what the content of all this is, you'll remember 50%. But the most powerful tool will be when you teach him. Then you remember 90%. So our entire education system has been set up upside down, from kindergarten to university. So how can we reverse that? I'm back from Lithuania two weeks ago. The country has as advantages, let me sort of say what they don't have. They don't have beaches. Uh, they don't have a lot of sun. They don't have pyramids, they don't have Greek temples. So what do they have? Well, they have optic cables and they have mobile phones. There are more than one mobile phone per, per inhabitant. Those are the SIMS cards. Now, the objective is we want to become a learning country. And specific things, all Lithuanians need to become, I don't know, below a certain level 40, by 2030, trilingual. Most of them are bilingual now. And the second thing is we need to use our tools for the 21st century appropriately. So here's what it takes time. We created Doraland. Doraland is an individual has a dream. For example, in my meeting, I had one young person, 17 year old, who was dreaming to learn Zen meditation in Burma. We had another one that went to spend a weekend with his hero, who is a Nobel Prize of Physics. Okay, another one went to learn to sail, whatever it is. We make a contract with a Lithuanian Learning Foundation. And the contract says, well, for that project, for that dream, you need to bring me 5,000 doras, another one, 7,000 doras. We make a contract. How do we do this? Well, when you do the activities that the dora provides, which is teaching and learning from others, then you get the Doras. And we create a whole economy, parallel to the normal economy, that actually is with the nonprofits that, or instead of competing with each other to get dollars, can actually get doing this. Now, when I have enough Doras, I realize my dream. Now, another specific example. Teenagers teach adults how to use the internet. Both receive Doras. Elderly people get interviewed by children by the age of 12 years. And the question they're asked is, what have you learned in your life that is useful, important for the 21st century? And they create a wisdom archive. And if it's multimedia, you get more Doras. And if it's the best 10 presentations of the year, you get more Doras still. So we create a whole economy for Doras. When I asked that kid, 17 year old, whether I pay him in euros or in dollars or whatever, he wants, he wants Doras. This becomes a superior currency. And it costs to the government zero. All right? Now, there are other examples. A currency to make the corporations think long term, called the Terra. Civics, currency we're talking about in Vermont right now, to provide cities 
uh, tools to create a caring society without burdening the governments in dollar terms. BWAS, ecological currency in Japan, which I've been presenting last year. Furiakipu, which is now operational for elderly care. 487 systems in Japan are operational. 1.8 million people are taken care of. So, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Let me conclude. We have proven scientifically that we need more than one currency to do the things right. Trying to do it with a single currency has this result. They tried at one point to put on the same rails, two trains. Now, we are going to an era where there's going to be deficit reductions of pressure, and we need more and more vital needs, including for climate change and for aging of society. It won't work on the same rail. The second aspect of that is that the monetary system is a bit in trouble. You may have noticed. There's a second reason. It's illustrated not in a French leftist journal in The Economist. Third reason, all patriarchal societies have always imposed a monopoly of a centralizing currency with positive interest rates for the last 5,000 years. It is what created the Industrial Revolution, but it also has created a series of problems that we're familiar with. All matrifocal societies, societies that honor feminine values, have always done what I'm talking about. It was the case in Egypt. It was the case in the Central Middle Ages, when feminine values were valued. The easiest way to understand what they are, which society you're in, is to look at what the image of the divine is. When you have a guy alone, who did it all by himself, with a big beard, you're in a patriarchal society. OK? By the way, in the Central Middle Ages, it was Notre Dame or lady. In Egypt, it was ISIS. The final reason, we are running out of options within the box. Just read the newspapers, the kind of contortions they are trying to make to make it happen. This is a well-trodden path. We've been there before. The last time was in the 1930s in this country. It leads to polarization, political polarization, which you can read about in your newspapers every day. And it leads, ultimately, to war. Roosevelt made the point that it wasn't the New Deal that solved the problem. It was getting ready for war. So we have to make a choice. That's what it looks like trying to do with the old way. That's what I propose we can do. That's what's possible. A balance between the masculine and the feminine but we need to do it in the money domain as well. This is the book that is currently available in the shop downstairs. This is a how-to book, particularly at the scale of cities. This is a book that provides the, the perspective of the uh, historical perspective as well as the systemic perspective. Thank you very much.